work, planning, execution of Julie Govert Walter. Is Julie here? Ah, here she is. She was in the, uh, bat in the back a moment ago. There are two uh, individuals at the... I bring you greetings from the Big Apple to the Little Apple. I have to confess that until I knew I was coming out here, I did not know, should have probably thought of it myself, but I didn't know that uh, Manhattan, Kansas was uh, known as the uh, Little Apple. And in driving around, I, I can see why you call it the Little Apple. It's an attractive place, and it's obviously growing. But uh, in driving around here, I see there's something missing. If you want to play in the Apple Leagues, there's something that you need here that we've got in the Big Apple and which I have going to make available to you at no cost. Uh, and that's a busload of drunks, derelicts, and muggers <laughs> so that you can get into the big leagues. And... Uh, they ought to be arriving just about the time you leave this hall. <laughs> so watch for them. I look out at this crowd, and, and it uh, reminds me of a cartoon a long time ago in uh, New Yorker magazine. It showed uh, a New York street in a manhole, and an octopus was coming up out of this manhole, and it had grabbed this consolidated Edison worker in one of its arms and was dragging him back down into the manhole and uh, there was a big mob of people around standing there watching and the caption was it sure doesn't take much to draw a crowd in Manhattan <laughs> and uh, I can only <laughs> I can only conclude that there's no basketball game tonight <laughs> I've only been to Kansas once, uh, once before this. I came, uh, I came over from Kansas City on that, on that glorified hang glider that Capital <laughs> Air, Capital Airlines uh, runs, runs into this town, and uh, it was, uh, the whole area was covered with clouds, and a very solid, uh, heavy overcast clouds, and we went down through it and down through it. And down through it, and I, I actually, I was not, uh, I wasn't nervous until we broke out of the clouds uh, a little ways over the ground, and I looked down, and I thought, my God, I thought Kansas was supposed to be flat. <laughs> I hadn't seen those hills before, and if I'd known they were there, I'd have been white knuckle all the way. Uh, I grew up in the West, and, uh, and it's, uh, and when you're flying in cloud c cover there, you're always they're always pretty nervous because there's always a mountain that's taller than you are wherever, no matter what elevation you're, you're uh, flying at. But I made it all right, and that's, that's what counts. I was on, uh, on television on, on uh, Christmas night at 10 o'clock at night. I, I didn't think anybody would ever watch television Christmas night at 10 o'clock particularly. It was a CBS show called Business in the Media, and it was on the CBS network. And uh, there were a couple of us jerks from the newspaper business somehow got mixed up with all the TV stars, Dan Rather and Morley Safer and Mike Wallace and all those guys. And I've been dumbfounded uh, at uh, the amount of mail I've gotten from around the country from, from people who saw that, uh, saw that broadcast. And I got a letter from a lady in Ottawa, Kansas which I, a uh, card, which I brought along, I thought I'd like to share with you, kind of uh, shows how, uh, how people count on the Wall Street Journal. It's a nice little card, it says, from my heart to yours. Uh, it's got a nice little mouse in, in, uh, on the front. It says, uh, says, dear sir, 
we watched you on the TV tonight with our Dan Rather and all. I don't know. I don't think Dan Rather's from, and I know he's not from Kansas. But we ended we ended our Christmas day with that, and it came to me that maybe you could help. We have this 1923 Ford original T model touring car, one owner. We are 67 and 62 years old, and we want to trade it in for a warrior Winnebago. <laughs> I, I, I don't know why that tickles me so, but it, <laughs> if, I had a, if I had a warrior Winnebago, I'd trade it with them for a, without batting an eye. Anyhow, anyhow, they went to the right man. I, I told them what to do. <laughs> I, uh, I I got to say that uh, uh, people in Manhattan are are awful kind and and nice people and and certainly friendly. Uh, if you haven't bought uh, tonight's issue of the Manhattan Mercury, uh, I urge you to do so. You can't all see this, but you can get the general idea. <laughs> <laughs> This is one of the best issues of a newspaper I ever saw in my life. <laughs> I, I don't know why they had to waste all that type over there. They could have... <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I get a hold of Ed Seaton and see whether a hundred of these comes cheaper than by the individual piece. <laughs> I fly a lot in my business, and... The more I fly, the less I like it. Uh, coming through those clouds sort of reminded me. I think if God had wanted man to fly, he never would have invented coach class. <laughs> it's hard to believe in this day and age, as the saying goes, when we can put a man on the moon that the airlines can't at least provide a sandwich that is edible. I've gone through a uh, rather odd exercise while I've been thinking what I was going to talk to you about tonight, and I've been thinking about it off and on for a month. Last year, I was far more pessimistic about the economy than the administration was and more pessimistic even than most of the uh, experts on our own Wall Street Journal staff. I couldn't for the life of me see anything encouraging, not even a glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel. And it gives me no great satisfaction to uh, know that I was more accurate in my own assumptions, which I, of course, wasn't foolish enough to print in the newspaper, uh, more accurate in my own assumptions of the way the economy was going than the so-called experts both inside and out of the government. In the past month or so, I've been feeling more optimistic, and I'm not sure why. Uh, maybe it's because I'm perverse, because now the administration is being so cautious about recovery, uh, saying that while the recovery is here, it's going to be very moderate mild, my natural perversity makes me suspect that things are going to be better than that. But when I sit down and look at the figures, at the numbers that I pay attention to uh, specifically, uh, to give me a feel of where I think the economy is going, give me an idea of what I ought to have the journal reporters looking at most closely, uh, I don't, uh, it's hard to buttress this feeling of optimism. Be that as it may, I want to spend a few minutes going over with you uh, some of the pertinent data so you can see where I, I'm coming from. And then I hope maybe there'll be some questions that will shed some real light on the subject. I am not an economist. Uh, I sometimes add thank God to that, but I won't tonight because I think there's some economists in the audience. Uh, uh, but I've spent an awful lot of time over the years reading economics, reading about economics, and talking to economists. So while I don't prof profess to 
have the absolute answers, I think I have some semi-educated thoughts on the subject. But first, since the title of my talk is Regonomics, what's next? I ought at least make a mention of that ill-born theory. The New York Times the other day had a quote from an unnamed source that I liked. Expecting Regonomics to work is like turning on the runway lights for Amelia Earhart. The facts, I'm afraid, are that when it comes to having a strategy capable of restoring economic prosperity, Regonomics has failed. I might add that Regonomics is a term that the press has hung on the administration's uh, economic program. The president himself uh, doesn't like it. Uh, you may have seen him the other day saying that he didn't like the term. It sounded like a fad diet which isn't a bad line. In March of 1981, the president told us that if his program was adopted, the economy would have a real growth rate of more than 4% between 81 and 82. In fact, the economy fell 1.8%. In February of 82, just a year ago, the president said, quote, I am convinced that our policies, now that they are in place, are the appropriate response to our current difficulties and will provide the basis for a vigorous economic recovery this year. The year in question, of course, is 82. It's come and gone. GNP was dropping at the end of the year, just like it was at the start of the year. The tragic thing is that this administration, because it's been captured by its slogans, has ignored the facts and as a result has prolonged the economic agony that many of our fellow citizens are suffering. This country has had six recessions since the end of World War II, since the end of World War II and the start of this one, which started in 1979. I use the year 79 ad advisedly. The economists uh, will tell you it started in the middle of 81, but they're using a set of economic numbers that don't have much connection with reality. You can't tell the people in the car business that the recession started in 81. They know it started in 79. You can't tell the people in the lumber and housing businesses that it started in 81. They know it started in 79. And you can't tell the farmers that it started in 81. What that means is those six recessions averaged only 11 months long, and the longest was 16 months, and the rate of recovery from them was rapid. We're now in about the 36th month of recession. Those fast recoveries didn't happen by accident. Whenever in the past government saw a recession, it rushed in with lower interest rates, job programs, fiscal stimulus, and extended unemployment benefits to protect those who had lost their jobs. This administration believed its rhetoric to the extent that it ignored the facts. It believed that the tax cut of last year would in fact turn things around and refuse, actually 81, not last year, uh, turn things around and refused to believe that it wasn't happening even when it was obvious to the layman that nothing was happening. As a result, whatever action is taken has been late. Just now, for example, is a jobs program going through uh, Congress and the move to extend the un uh, unemployment benefits. Should have happened a year ago. But enough history, at least for the moment. Let's talk about some of the numbers that I think are important. Car sales are a good indication of how people feel about the economy. Postponing the purchase of a car is the easiest thing in the world to do, and that's what's been happening. The average age of a car on the road today is seven years. It's jumped two years over the last three. People simply have been not buying new cars, hanging on to the old ones. Even though it's an aggravation to get them repaired, it's cheaper than buying a new car. Last month, sales of domestically built cars were up 13% from a year ago, the third consecutive month of increase. And it's true that the U uh, U.S. companies are planning 
uh, production in the first quarter of anywhere from 15 to 80 percent, depending on the individual companies. Those, however, are plans, and if the sales don't materialize, they can quickly cut them back. However, remember what I said, car sales have been dropping since 79. Roger Smith, the chairman of General Motors the other day, predicted a 10 percent increase in sales this year, but he also said a 10 percent increase from terrible is still terrible. So there's not much encouragement in those numbers so far. Unemployment. A lot of people took heart last month when the unemployment rate dropped from 10.8 percent to 10.4 percent. A drop of almost half a point is a lot. Unfortunately, it was, I think, a fluke. Employment didn't rise, which it should have if a half a million people, nearly a half a million people, dropped off the unemployment rolls employment should have risen. What happened, I think, was that those people just quit looking for work, and under the laws, if you're not going down to the employment office, you're not counted as unemployed. But they're just as unemployed as the ones who are counted. Uh, I have a suspicion that, in fact, uh, the employment to unemployment rate may go back up in the month of February partly because of uh, the usual February bad weather. Unfortunately, the administration is predicting that at best, at the end of this year, the unemployment rate will still be 9.5 percent, which is more than 10 million unemployed. And I simply don't believe that you can have a recovery by in any meaningful fashion if you've got 10 million unemployed. So there's no encouragement so far in those numbers. Housing starts. In past recessions, housing has been the first industry to show renewed vigor. vigor. If January's numbers are an indication, then happy days are here. January starts rose 35% from December, which is an enormous jump. Building permits, which are a pretty good indicator, uh, because builders get the permits and then build the houses a little bit later, uh, rose 16 percent, the fifth month in a row that they've risen. I must confess that I'm puzzled by these big jumps in housing. Uh, while mortgage rates have dropped from 16 and 17 percent down to an effective rate of around 14 percent, that's still an enormous amount of money to pay for a mortgage. At 14 percent, a $50,000 mortgage, which is pretty small these days, will cost you $580 a month in interest alone, not a dime on the principal. I have a theory that a lot of builders who have been barely hanging on have started a lot of homes in the hope that mortgage rates will drop to something more reasonable by the time the houses are completed and go up for sale. I define a reasonable level as single digit, that is 9% or less. And I didn't think I'd ever live to see the day when I thought a 9% mortgage would be considered reasonable by anybody. If I'm right in my theory and they're right in their forecasts, then a recovery may truly be underway because a housing recovery not only uh, gins up uh, the lumber mills, but it starts a lot of uh, refrigerator manufacturers and stove manufacturers that call people back and rug makers and all the things that go into a house. If they're wrong, then a lot more builders are going to go belly up in the next three or four months. And that permits me to sig you not too gracefully into the issue of interest rates and thus the Federal Reserve. For in my book, if you want a villain upon whom to pin the blame for the economy's current troubles, you won't go wrong in picking a six-foot, seven-inch, cigar-smoking central banker named Paul Volcker, the chairman of the Federal Reserve. I must say that what I'm about to say is a matter of some dispute, including on this campus where at lunch today one of the faculty economists disagreed with me flatly on my views on Paul Volcker and his role in this recession. <coughs> My only uh, satisfaction 
is I know he can't prove that I'm wrong. I can't prove that he's right or wrong either, but, uh, but that's the world of economics. Mr. Volcker became chairman in the fall of 1979 with the avowed aim of wringing inflation out of the economy. I must say I agreed with that goal. From 1968 until 1981, I thought the most important problem facing this country was inflation. When Volcker came in, we were on the way toward 14% annual rate of inflation, heading towards 17% in the Consumer Price Index, which is the most common, uh, commonly known. And incidentally, speaking of inflation and those incredible numbers, and we're now slightly under 4%, do you know what the inflation rate was in August of 1971 when... Richard Nixon, in desperation, slapped the country on wage and price controls and took us off the gold standard, less than 4.5%. The administration today says it's got inflation licked, and they're predicting between 45 and 5.5%. So people's perception of certainly change over time of what is terrible. Apparently operating under the theory that nothing succeeds like excess, the Fed rang the water out of inflation and rang the neck of the economy at the same time. In less than three years, the inflation rate dropped to, to less than 4% from running around 15 or so at the time. The net result was nobody could buy anything except for cash. The prime rate hit 21%, and the prime is the rate banks charge their best customers. You can imagine what they were charging their less than best. Your neighborhood mafia loan shark gave you a better rate than your friendly neighborhood bank. That clamp down, clamp down on the money supply lasted until last August, when the Fed reversed course and began pumping up the money supply again. Short-term interest rates dropped sharply and quickly. Long-term interest rates dropped a little slower and stopped dropping, as have short-term rates. And that's where we are right now. In order to keep people confused about its purpose, the Fed has insisted it wasn't uh, easing up on money all the time that it was, because Volcker's afraid that the inflationary spiral will start again if people think that the Fed is pumping up the money supply, which it is. I think that with factories operating under 70% of capacity, steel running at 40%, 12 million or more unemployed, that inflation is the wrong thing to be wor worrying about now. It really is a terrible guessing game trying to figure out what the Federal Reserve is really up to. Don Regan, the Secretary of the Treasury, said last week, quote, we aren't going to try to second-guess the Fed. They tell us they're confused about what's going on. We're just saying, try to get it straight. We're hopeful that they'll figure it out as soon as they can. That doesn't seem to be too much to ask of our central bankers. It's going to be fascinating to see whether the President will reappoint him Re reappoint Volcker as chairman when his uh, term runs out uh, in August. Uh, I, th I think they ought to take their courage and let him re and, re and point somebody else. A colleague on the uh, on the faculty here says that uh, all, if they do that, all they're trying to do is find a scapegoat uh, for the economy, the mess the economy is in, and. Uh, that wouldn't be fair, and it wouldn't be right. I think it would be both fair and right. Earlier, I said I've been feeling much more optimistic lately than I had been. Listen to myself talk here. It's, it's kind of hard to say why. I guess it's because the last year I didn't see even a glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel. Today I do. Just a glimmer, mind you, but a glimmer just the same. Car sales are up a bit. Housing's up a lot. Interest rates are down, not far enough. 
but they're down, so I do see a glimmer. I haven't talked about the incredible budget deficits we're facing, or the big trade deficit, or imports, or protectionism, or farm prices, or Social Security, or the defense budget, or oil prices, or the bank loans, all of which I'm an expert on, of course, you understand. And you'll be happy to know I'm not going to talk about those things. But maybe we'll touch on some of those subjects in the question period. And I, uh, you may have heard uh, of Professor Irwin Corey, who bills himself as the world's greatest authority. But he's not, I am. And, uh, and so I'll be happy now to entertain questions uh, uh, on, the, on the economy, what I've had to say or haven't said, or on the press, most any other, anything that's uh, worth debating in a public audience. Yes? The question is, how about those bank loans? Are they going to wreck us all? Uh, I don't think so. It's going to be a fairly uh, nervy time for a while. What we're talking about is the enormous exposure some very major U.S. banks have in loans to foreign countries, Mexico being a prime example, uh, Brazil being another one, Argentina being another, who, uh, who aren't going to be able to uh, pay them back very soon, if ever. And so our uh, government is... Uh, is uh, hooping it up that uh, through the International Monetary Fund we ought to kick in, I think, another $4 billion, and the Monetary Fund will loan some money to the countries and get the banks to roll them over over their own loans. And I think that's probably what will happen. Dislike it as you must. I mean, I, I think I'd probably enjoy the sight of the president of one of the country's biggest banks squiggling in the like a butterfly on a pin and in front of a House committee explaining how he'd let his bank go bankrupt, but it wouldn't be very good for the country. Uh, they All these banks have got taken each other's wash of pieces of each other's loan, and you can't let the big ones go down, bad management or not. What, uh, what we ought to push uh, is that they uh, stop paying dividends, write down some of these loans the way down more realistic level and take a bath if they have to on from that standpoint but uh, I think we're going to get through it uh, but it it's fairly nervy time yes you Well, it's, a, it's something that helps. It's not the solution. It's not the answer. Uh, but it'll help a bit. It'll put people back to work, even though they're going to be subsidized, even though it's going to add to the deficit. People working uh, are better off than people, uh, better for the country than people not working, not just for their personal pride, but from the economic standpoint. Uh, they'll pay taxes, even if, uh, even if, Money's just going around in a circle. Uh, so I th and furthermore, maybe uh, I mean maybe if they put them to work uh, in the right places, we'll actually imp improve some of the so-called infrastructure in this country, which is certainly collapsing around us. The work the work needs to be done, and if we can't do it uh, with private funds, well, we're going to have to do some of it with public funds anyhow. And I uh, I just I think it's late. Uh, but I think it's better than nothing. Yes, sir. I don't know who I'd pick. Uh, I kind of like the vice chairman of the Fed, Preston Martin. I knew him a bit in California. But you can't tell how a, how a chairman of the, is going to act as chairman of the Fed until he's the chairman of the Fed, unfortunately, because they always say all the right things when they're going up there for their confirmation hearings. So I don't, I don't have any secret candidate in any place. Uh, you know, vote no. Uh, uh, 
I, uh, I think the Fed has behaved so badly over the last 10 or 15 years that it raises a real question in my mind whether it's fulfilling its function, uh, which is to be an independent body with weighing judiciously. Uh, I don't think the Congress could have run the money supply much worse than the Federal Reserve has in the last four or five years. Yes. Next couple of years? Well, I, I uh, hope we get back to uh, something more normal than we're in now. I am pretty pessimistic uh, for a variety of reasons that un Can they or will they? I think they can. I think they will. Uh, I mean, everybody's gotten cheap loans uh, uh, through the IMF or the World Bank one way or the other, and and uh, all those bankers hang out together and one way together on the and on these uh, on these big debts uh, hanging over, particularly third world uh, third world countries. Uh, I think they probably will. It's a, you know, it's a sort of messy, awkward kind of situation, but, but I, I think they're going to get together. Yes, ma'am. What do I see as a future in newspapers? Well, I think they're going to last through my lifetime, which is, uh, <laughs> which is one of my primary concerns. <laughs> I don't. Uh, I'm not much worried about newspapers. There's a lot of changes going on uh, in the newspaper business, but the newspaper business. Uh, I mean, we're in a recession right now, like everybody. But basically, it's thriving. Uh, there's the same number of newspaper, daily newspapers in this country today as there was 20 years ago, or within a half a dozen, the same number. What's happened is a lot of big city papers have gone bust. A lot of suburban newspapers have started and done very well. And the small town newspapers in this country have, almost without exception, are, are uh, going along nicely and thriving in good years just like everybody else. I think there's going to be newspapers uh, forever. I don't think people are entirely going to depend upon television for their news. Uh, I'm concerned about uh, the literacy rate in this country. Uh, I mean, my kids are not readers, and that hurts. Uh, and I know lots of people my age who've got kids say they don't, their kids don't read. Uh, look at the newspaper a little bit, but uh, don't read books, watch television. So I suppose you could paint a pretty gloomy picture, but I. Realistically, I think newspapers are going to be around an awful long time. They may change in ways I can't foresee, but I, but again, I don't see people canceling their news, newspaper to get their news on a television set, even if the news has been prepared by the newspaper. We're all trying to keep one foot in that side of the fence just in case we're wrong. Uh, we're doing that. I mean, the Wall Street Journal's doing that, and Knight Ritter, everybody's doing it big and small keep an eye on what the enemy is up to, and if it turns out that the enemy is, uh, is right, we'll quickly join him, but I don't, I don't think so. One more question, perhaps. Yes, ma'am. Excuse me? I didn't hear. By even better, you mean worse? <laughs> you mean greater unemployment or less? less? Less unemployment? Yeah, I think there's going to be less unemployment. The question is how much, how much is, how much less? As I said earlier, the administration says 
at, at the end of the uh, end of the uh, year, they don't see anything better than nine and a half percent rate, which is, it works out to well over 10 million unemployed. Uh, they may be right, but I wouldn't consider that we had had a recovery if we still had 10 million people <laughs> unemployed. But I I must say I agree that. Uh, that uh, it's going to be a slow process of getting unemployment down to anywhere that anybody consider a reasonable n number. We have a lot of steel workers who aren't going to go back to work, and a lot of car workers aren't going to go back to work, and so those numbers are going to be tough to work down. Well, I want to thank you uh, very much for your attention. I've had a marvelous time. I hope you had uh, some uh, laughs, if nothing more. Thank <laughs> you.